Good morning. I'm uh, John Shattuck. As you know, I'm the president and rector of Central European University, and I have as my guest here uh, Joe Stiglitz, who's uh, one of the most distinguished economists in the world. I'm very pleased to have Joe, have you here with us at this conference at the uh, uh, sponsored by CEU and the Institute for New Economic Thinking in Budapest. Uh, let me just say a few words of introduction of Joe, who's so well known that I don't need to say more than a few words, but uh, um, again, uh, a very distinguished economist, a uh, member of President Clinton's uh, uh, Economic Council and uh, uh, winner of the Nobel uh, Prize uh, for Economics in 2001, uh, has done uh, really uh, extraordinary work in extending the field uh, of economic thinking in many different directions. But at the same time, uh, I think it's fair to say, Joe, that you, you've also been uh, one of the uh, shall we say critical and, and dissident voices within the profession for some years. Um, and we now, of course, are in the midst of a, a horrific global economic crisis. Your voice has been uh, clear on that from the outset, not only of the crisis, but long before that. Uh, one of the things that you are noted for is the work that you've done on uh, the economics of information. And uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about this, because I think it's at the heart, of, if I, as I understand it, of your own critique of the dominant doctrine that has been uh, so much uh, pursued by policymakers and others, which has, to a large extent, got us into the uh, problems that we're in today. Well, the, the basic <clears throat> notion, uh, the basic models that have prevailed for ever in economics were based on the assumption that uh, people had either perfect information or if they didn't have perfect information, the information that they had didn't change in any way in the course of what happened. Individuals didn't signal to others what they were uh, characteristics. Uh, we're sitting here in uh, the Karl Popper room, and one makes one think of uh, a philosophy. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, uh, in traditional economics, everybody traded in platonic ideals. There was a, a dog or a steel, and all steel was the same, all dogs were the same, and no resources were mm -hmm. allocated to differentiating who were better workers, what were better projects, all this was put underneath the, the screen. And uh, I argue that uh, actually these information activities were really embraced a lot of what was going on in the economy. And more importantly, that the key results of economics depended on those information assumptions. So the most important idea is uh, perhaps the most important idea was Adam Smith's idea of a visible hand, the markets are uh, pursued of self-interest leagues as if by an invisible hand to the well-being of uh, society. Well, uh, people had asked what were the conditions under which that was true, mm. but they never, what's always interesting is what people take so ingrained in their being that they don't even think of as an assumption, and that was the information assumptions. So I asked, was that result true if there was imperfect information? And mm. the result was, no, in general, it was not. Uh, traditional theory had come up with the result that there's no such thing as unemployment because demand equals supply. Mm. Uh, and that meant <clears throat> also demand equals supply for labor, no unemployment. Well, the theories that I developed then based on imperfect information were said that may not be true, mm -hmm. that you can get situations with persistent demand being less than supply, i.e. persistent unemployment. As I went through that kind of analysis and tried to study what an econo economy might look like with imperfect information, I came to the conclusion that while this new theory would explain an awful lot of what we saw. It couldn't explain many things. Mm, mm. It was much better than the older theory, but it itself had some big deficiencies. Mm. And in the end, 
I came to the view that the deeper hypothesis, the underlying hypothesis of full rationality was not true. Mm -hmm. And that's been so manifested in this recent crisis that people did things that are hard to reconcile with uh, the kind of rational actor mm -hmm. that has been at the center of economic theory. Uh, and we all now talk about how foolish they were. But the interesting thing, economics is a social science, and that means it looks at patterns, mm -hmm. not just the occasional aberration, but patterns. And what's remarkable is there's this boom-bust pattern, this pattern of rational exuberance and then followed by rational pessimism has been a mm -hmm. pattern that mm -hmm. we've seen over and over again. And it was a real failing of the mm -hmm. economics profession to become subject to this doctrine of, irration, mm -hmm. of, of rationality mm -hmm. when the evidence against it was staring at them in the face. I thought the, one of the most interesting things you said at the conference yesterday, picking up on this point, uh, was that there, the actors in an economic system, and particularly the one that we've just seen collapse, uh, were themselves acting within a framework of, of, of self-interested rationality, if you will, but that the whole system was permeated by irrationality. Uh, how, do we, how do we square that circle, if you will? I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting concept. Yeah, well, there, there are actually two uh, slightly separate points. One of them is, what I try to argue, is that when you have some people who are irrational, mm -hmm. you can have other people who are rationally exploiting their irrationalities. Mm -hmm. So if you have poor, uneducated people who don't understand finance, you have investment banks mm -hmm. that look for these poor people to prey on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way I characterize this in my book, Freefall, is to say the banks discovered that there was money at the bottom of the pyramid and they said, it's not going to remain there. Mm -hmm. And they did everything they could to move it to the top mm -hmm. without regard to any sense of ethics, fair play, uh, and so forth. And, and there's an important role for regulation mm -hmm. to stop that kind of exploitation. But the second way of thinking about it is the sum of individual rationality does not add up to collective rationality. Now, we know that. Uh, we've known that for a long time, the famous example of the prisoner's dilemma where, mm -hmm. where two prisoners, if they would cooperate together, would be able to get out of prison, but individually it's rational for them not to cooperate mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. they get. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the miracle of Adam Smith's invisible hand was this result mm -hmm. that non-cooperative behavior, individual pursuit of their self-interest, would lead to cooperative well-being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is the result that's not true. Yeah. And but we have to understand what went wrong with that theorem. You mm -hmm. know, why was that not true? The principle, if you will, uh, the old sort of adage of self-love and social are the same. In fact, they aren't the same in that respect. That's right. And, I mean, and today, I don't think anybody would say that the banker's pursuit of their self-interest right, right. led to society's well-being. Mm -hmm. We know it's mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. So in a way, for the economics profession, it presents a challenge because we have a, a clear demonstration that everybody understands that Adam Smith's theorem is wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the edifice on which 200 years of work has been built Mm -hmm. And so this is where INET comes in and says, look, you have 200 years mm -hmm. of people constructing models on a set of hypotheses where we know the results are wrong, mm -hmm. and wrong in a very deep way. There have been other instances where we've known they're wrong, like people can pollute too much, they don't take mm -hmm. care of the environment. Mm -hmm. But those we, we could push in a corner. You know, yes, the market doesn't handle environmental problems, uh, but this is at the core of capitalism. Yeah, yeah, this is at yeah. the core of capitalism. And what we've seen is at the core of capitalism, 
the result is not true. Is it partly a function of size? I mean, a great deal of emphasis has been put on the uh, 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 clearly the, the large, too big to fail entities, banks in particular, uh, end up being the ones that behave in the way that is particularly antisocial. And if you reduce the size of economic units, do you get back to the Adam Smith uh, approach, or is it equally flawed? You, you don't get back, but it's not equally flawed. <laughs> the very big banks have a particular problem called too big to fail, which means that they have incentives for excessive risk taking. If they gamble and they win, they walk off of the profits, they lose, taxpayers pick up the tab. They know that, and therefore that leads to what we call a misalignment of incentives. Mm -hmm. Their incentives are different from societal mm -hmm. incentives. But uh, even small institutions have two broad categories of problems that, again, I talk about in my book, Freefall. One of them is that an agency problem. The guys running the banks, in general, are running it on behalf of their shareholders, mm. other stakeholders, depositors, it's still FDIC, still government deposit insurance, all of which leads to the fact that the decision makers' interests are not, in general, aligned with societies. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, that even if that were true, at the level of the bank, mm -hmm. the bank or mo many banks could engage in similar behavior. They could all be caught up mm -hmm. in the bubble mania, mm -hmm. all do things which would systemically lead to problems. And though each individually might know that it would was not too big to fail, they also know that if they all engage in correlated behavior and they fail, mm -hmm. they will be bailed out. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. bailout problem doesn't disappear when you get small. That's the moral hazard kind of issue. It's the moral that you, hazard that you, issue. That you, you brought out more than perhaps almost any other economist. Um, I, uh, we need to, uh, unfortunately, uh, move to a last question. So let me give you a, a last question here. Um, and it's going to be a sort of combined question because uh, I want to get your... Uh, both your advice as a, a, an economist who has had to give advice to governments and also your perspective on, on the, the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Um, what now could be done by uh, governments, particularly, let's say, the United States government, which is the one that you're most familiar with, um, familiar with many others as well, but uh, to uh, to address the uh, the great economic uncertainties of the future, and what should be done is, I mean, if we put our Keynesian hats on and just say we ought to do more deficit spending, uh, this is Paul Krugman's approach yesterday in the New York Times. Um, and then the second part of this question, sort of related, is. How should INET as an organization be looking at uh, the bridge between economic theory, which we've been talking about, and policy making, uh, which is uh, really what's bedeviling so much of the world today? Well, on the first question, I, I, I think there's a clear agenda of what needs to be done. Uh, Krugman is absolutely right. Uh, we need more fiscal support, what we did was too small, but it has to be well designed. There are concerns about the deficit, and that means what we need to do is we have to spend more on investments that increase productivity in the long run, promote growth, and therefore actually the debt will go down, which we should mm -hmm. focus on the long run. So that's one. Secondly, we still have not gotten our banking system functioning. Uh, the gambling banks, the speculative banks, the investment banks are working, but not the banks that lend to ordinary Americans. Mm -hmm. The flow of credit is lower. So we have to create a new set of financial institutions that actually go back to mm -hmm. what they should. Our, re our regulatory efforts were uh, not fully successful, and particularly not successful in reorienting banking, not changing the banking model. Mm -hmm. Third, in America, we need to do something about the rash of foreclosures to... Uh, Two million Americans lost their home in 2008, two million more than that in 2009, and we expect even more than that in 2010. So the problem that gave rise to the current crisis mm -hmm. has not been resolved. Uh, I think there are 
broader, bigger issues uh, that ought to be addressed as we uh, address the short run issues. And I think if you do it right, it will actually, you can make progress on both simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if we had a high price of carbon, mm -hmm. we would stimulate level, high, higher levels of investment, which would help promote short run growth, but would also have us deal with the problem of global warming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we ought to be thinking about what are our national needs and how we can uh, use this moment of crisis to spend more mm -hmm. in the public sector to push us towards that. Uh, the part of the problem that has not been addressed is that there's a steep structural problem, a set of structural problems in the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, just changing aggregate demand is not going mm -hmm. to, on its own, mm -hmm. address that. Mm -hmm. Now, where uh, INET becomes important uh, is twofold. One, the level of analysis that we've seen of these policy discussions has been very low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's because the models that have been used have been very simple and people have not mm -hmm. tried to take a broader context. But more broadly, it was policymakers succumbing to, I say, ideology and a set of models that serve that ideology that led to the crisis. Mm -hmm. People who believe that bubbles couldn't exist, that government shouldn't do anything. And while you know, some people in the discussion pointed out that the models didn't lead to the bad behavior, the policymakers chose the models to confirm their beliefs, I think if there were a more robust set of models out there arguing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. look at you forgot this, this, and that, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the policymakers would be challenged. Mm -hmm. and, and, challenge more effectively, there'd be more voices at least out there saying, look, mm -hmm. you're going down a road that is terribly dangerous. So this is really the INET mission, if you will. It's to, to promote the kind of heterodoxy of, of modeling as well as uh, more robust policy advice that uh, is based on, on, on a broader set of models. That's right. Yeah. But, and, but when you see heterodoxy, I think one also ought to point out that uh, the real problem is that the core model of the economic profession was very badly flawed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's almost a reconstruction right, effort. It's right, not right. just diversity that we're concerned with. It's really uh, throwing out Mm -hmm. uh, some of the models that became fashionable that were out of touch mm -hmm. with what was really going on and mm -hmm. where people had put blinders on mm -hmm. to get themselves convinced that these were good descriptions. Mm -hmm. So even the empirical tests that they were using were flawed, and that's where yeah. you know, work like David Hendry yeah. saying, look, at the way you judge whether something was good or not was actually flawed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Joe, I'd love to keep this con conversation going for as long as we possibly could, but unfortunately we're out of time. So I, I thank you very thank much you. for being with us here in Budapest, for giving us the benefit of your uh, extraordinary and, and very provocative thinking on, on new economics. Thank, thank you. you, Joe.